No, I mean, my, my, my grandparents were American communists, so I, I, I recognize this line of, of, of discourse very, very well. And um, No idea what that's supposed to be. They never used the word communist to me. They would always say progressive. And, and so, so, you know, when I basically, like, lump together, when I, one of the things that's very irritating when you talk to leftists is, you know, you'll, you'll basically be ascribed some po policy to, like, the popular front of Judea, and they'll be like, no, that's a policy of the Judean popular front. We're totally against the People's <laughs> Front of Judea, right? You know, and sort of that's kind of the, like, when I use the New York Times as a metonym for sort of the whole space of intelligent opinion, um, could, you know, I, I, I realize I could, I think, that you object you could, to being I think you included could spend in the, that. Yes, uh, you're right. It is irritating to leftists when you say things that lump together things that are at opposite extremes, fail to make basic right. distinctions because but they don't fuck with their world view. They are very your much, they are very much, so small, they are very much they look at opposite. They very, very different. They are very much at opposite extremes and certainly on the question of views towards American foreign policy, again, there's a reason that, that uh, the New York Times uh, makes Noam Chomsky uh, you know, grind his teeth if you read uh, Chomsky and Herman, Manufacturing Consent, which is where everything that's plausible and what Curtis says about the cathedral comes from. Uh, if, you, uh, if you read that, I think he is, is he, is very, uh, he 20s, is very point, he is very on point uh, about uh, the ways in which uh, Cold War anti-communism certainly uh, shaped uh, the space of uh, political discourse that could be allowable in the New York Times, about how certain reflexive assumptions about American foreign policy did, and certainly about the relationship between the thing that he never wants to talk about, which is the actual power centers in American society, which are not journalists and academics at all, right? Those are hired hands. Uh, you know, the actual power centers in American society um, are people who own that stuff. Uh, and no, what they want, I think differs just a little bit more. You know, I think that uh, I think that what corporate oligarchs who own media want is not particularly what I want. And if you think the difference between corporate oligarchs getting everything they want and democratic socialism is a difference between the Popular Front for the Liberation of Judea and the Judean Liberation Army or whatever the hell the Monty Python line is, I, I would just respectfully submit that you're not thinking about it very carefully. Yeah, I, I, it's it's actually it's a super, let's go into actually the ownership of journalism question or the management of journalism question because I think it's actually a super interesting question. I think one of the important you know a lot of a lot of what you of of your narrative, which basically strikes me as almost entirely out of touch with the way things work in this country today, strikes me as much more resonant with the way things worked in, say, the 1920s. And so I feel like I'm sort of, when you talk about co corporate oligarchs, I feel like I'm like we're talking about the ghost of J.P. Morgan and Henry Clay Frick and and people like that. Or gosh, I think Jeff if you Bezos. actually if you look at so so let's talk about Jeff Bezos for yeah, for, for a moment because um, I would be um, if Jeff Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post, okay, um, the Salzberger family has managing control of the New York Times. There is an important difference here, and the difference is it is almost impossible for me to imagine Jeff Bezos trying to manipulate the New York Times, the Washington Post news desk, in order to get, for example, favorable coverage for Amazon. That would be unbelievable to me, based on the limited knowledge, I'm not in the profession, based on the limited knowledge that I have of the way journalism works. Whereas at the Times, the Sulzberger family, which is the last great family of media oligarchs, still has an influence on the managing editor and basically the choice of the news. I was talking to, not the person you would think, someone who's connected to like a media oligarch, and they were like, from a left-wing perspective actually, uh, or not a media, like a, a tech oligarch, a left-wing tech oligarch, and they were like, you know, maybe we should just buy the New York Times and like convert it to like effective altruism or whatever. And I'm like, you know, look at the market cap. It's like I could put it on my MasterCard, you know? And I'm like, no, you can't put it on your MasterCard because you can't, if the Salzburgers would never sell to you, but if you could buy that, you would find that you were just another basically sponsor of, of 
an almost entirely autonomous organization. And that, like, but yeah, if you go back to the 20s, and, you know, the golden age of, you know, or the system that, say, Joseph Pulitzer was trying to destroy, the golden age of, like, Hearst and Yellow journalism, if you look at Hearst's influence over the Hearst press, and you compare it to Bezos' influence over the newspaper that he owns, uh, I would say there are probably four orders of magnitude in difference between that level of influence. And so it's like when I basically think of you as a kind of operating in this kind of caricatured mythos, which I can trace back to the 20s, I think one of the ways that you could have of asking yourself that question mm -hmm. is by going back to when these things were actually true and looking at that reality and comparing it to the reality of today. Yeah, how about the early 2000s? Would, uh, would that be more like the, uh, the 1920s or would it be more like now? Uh, tell, me, tell me your early 2000s Well, story. how about MSNBC? Look at the, uh, <laughs> look at the political transformations of that network, <laughs> right? That they, had a, uh, that they, were, uh, they were at one point uh, trying to, uh, to compete uh, you know, with, uh, with Fox for the right wing space. They, hide, they, hmm. they fired the people who were against the Iraq war uh, who, uh, who worked there. And uh, then seeing a better marketing opportunity later, they dramatically transitioned into what they are now, right? Which so, is, so, you know, okay, which is, so, so, so. Which is the Lib Network. And I don't think. Let's talk you about know, Fox. Can we talk directly about Fox? I mean, we can talk about Fox too, but Let's I mean, that, the, 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 point, the, the point of the MSNBC example is that's a very direct example of, uh, of ownership making, uh, making decisions that dramatically change what the newsroom looks like. So, yeah, so if you basically talk about, and, and I didn't know that piece of history with MSNBC, let's talk about Fox, which is something that I know basically much better. So the Fox business, like Fox is not the real media. Like, and, and this is something that has sort of only become clearer over time. It's like these sort of idiots who wanted to expose, you know, the sort of Biden-Ukraine corruption by leaking Hunter Biden's emails to the New York Post. They might as well have been leaking them to the trash can or to QAnon or to 4chan. They probably would have done better to leak them to 4chan, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, the, the sense in which basically journalism that is respected journalism operates by changing elite opinion. Let me give you an example from my own, well, not my knowledge. So I, I, um, I you know, have a number of DC kinds of connections and one of the things I like to brag about is that my mother has actually kissed Joe Biden. And it was not a romantic kiss. Um, it was because uh, she's married to my stepfather who worked on the Hill for Biden um, for many years and uh, he, in turn, got his PhD in 1965 in political science from Harvard and then went off to work for Democrats on the Hill, which he did for 20 years. Now he teaches at Hopkins. And he recounts this story. Do you know the name McGeorge Bundy? Mm -hmm. uh, he was in a seminar taught by McGeorge Bundy um, in sometime in the mid-60s at Harvard. And there was something that happened back then uh, when they had sort of more real unions, which they had strikes. And there was a newspaper strike on at the time, and McGeorge Bundy comes in, and of course he has a DC role in addition to being at Harvard. He comes into the room with these like bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you know, 1960s suit and tie wearing, you know, political science students. He's like, well, you know, Washington can't function now. We've lost our inner office memo system. Meaning the New York Times. And and you know, the effect of essentially authorized kind of official story journalism does not go through the public before it has an impact. It goes basically from one arm of the state to another. And so when the Times, you know, basically writes a story about, hey, you know, EPA isn't cracking down on this abuse, EPA gets on it tomorrow, you know, that's real, that's real power. Fox doesn't have that power. And Fox, so, you know, when you basically see Fox going out there and marketing to the plebes, they've basically made a decision to make money rather than power out of journalism. And, um, you know, I believe that's crass and horrifying and, you know, I have the negative opinion about it, but you probably do. But that's, to me, a really, really huge difference. Okay, let's take another question.